New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast mini-series titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I have put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 731 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. Hey, I have another excellent episode lined up for you this week. Joining me as my guest is Oren Claff. Oren, you may know, is the best-selling author of the book, Pitch Anything, an innovative method for presenting, persuading, and winning the deal. And in this week's episode, I'll be talking with Oren about his new book, Flip the Script, Getting People to Think Your Idea is Their Idea. And in this no-holds-barred and sometimes raw conversation, Oren and I dive into why you need to flip the script on today's empowered buyers and have them chase you versus you pursuing them, how to develop resilient buyers that are motivated to work with you, how to level up your status, and this is a concept Oren writes about in the book, how to level up your status to earn trust and minimize objections, what a flash roll is and why you need one, how to be perceived as an insider in your buyer's business, And we'll also talk about his inception method that he writes about in this book and how you can use that to help the buyer think your idea is their idea. All this and much, much more. Now, before we get to Oren, I want to take a second to talk to you about VanillaSoft. Now, VanillaSoft is the industry's leading sales engagement platform. So, what does that mean? Well, it means you can eliminate sales lead cherry picking by your sales reps means your sales reps will make more than two or three outreach attempts for every lead they get. And it means each rep will actually follow an omni-channel cadence. Now, to help you with that, you need to check out VanillaSoft's Ultimate Guide to Prospecting. In this guide, Daniel Disney and Daryl Prale will show you how to combine cold calling with social selling for outrageous results. So you can get that now at VanillaSoft.com forward slash Andy Paul. That's me. That is VanillaSoft.com forward slash Andy Paul. All right, let's jump into it. Oren, welcome to the show. All right, that is the shortest welcome I've ever had, but it felt warm. <laughs> it's, it's very warm. So, fellow San Diegan, I mean, hey, we're on the same team. So, um, yeah, welcome. You just, we're going to talk today about your book, Flip the Script, Getting People to Think Your Idea is Their Idea. And I have to admit, I, as I said before we started recording, I really enjoyed reading it. And I think people enjoy reading it because you make such good use of stories to, to illustrate your points. And so I can certainly recommend it to people that are listening. So um, you start lead off the book saying that we've grown resistant to sales persuasion. In your mind, is this a new phenomenon or it's something that's always been or is just a function of you know, as you get older, you become more resistant to persuasion? 
Yeah, I think my first book, Pitch Anything, covered persuasion, selling, influence fairly thoroughly. Uh, things have changed over the last 10 years, uh, in the last five years, dramatically in my experience. And that's, I think, why Flip the Script was needed, is that today, buyers uh, have gotten in control. Before they felt in control, mm -hmm. And they felt empowered and they would say, hey, submit a proposal. I'll take a look at it. I got to get it up to the committee, the CFO, mm -hmm. the CEO, my partner, the Loch Ness Monster and Sasquatch have to look at this, you know, because they approve all my budgets. Yeah. Uh, and that was a problem, but there was ways through that. Today, the buyer uh, is, is functionally empowered, right? In, in which they, once they know the price, and they know the features, they know the benefits, and they know the ROI, they know the value proposition. They go, thanks. Very interesting. We're super excited. I got to show this to my partner and mm -hmm. committee, mm -hmm. board of directors, you know, get some approval on this. And then they put you in a box up on the shelf, right? And you're there as an option. Now they, their business has become to find what you offer cheaper or for free. And because it's now possible to do that. See, before it used to be about negotiation, uh, and grinding, and that was a process to reduce your margin, but you still had a decent shot at getting the deal. Today, they are going to look for a replacement option for whatever it is you sell, accounting services, uh, uh, you know, physical products, laptops, security, consulting, uh, you know, healthcare, medical device, it doesn't matter. They're mm -hmm. looking for it. And I use this example, uh, I, uh, I've started running pretty aggressively, I've always worked out. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I need these things called a Normatech. It's a compression device. You go to normatech.com and it's $2,500. Oh, okay, click to buy. Oh, wait a second. Let me check on Amazon. $2,300. Oh, that was good, right? Let me, because I, I buy a lot of cars and motorcycles and stuff. I hop over to eBay. Oh, use twice on eBay, $1,900, right? Oh, click to buy. You know what? Let me just check Craigslist. $1,700. Use two times. I'm a tri retiring triathlete. Come get them. So for eight, I don't need $800. Right. But the buyer at all levels, and this is a consumer experience, has been mm -hmm. gamified to the um, to reprice you, find another option, and they're in total control. And if you can't have them want what you have and say, we should be in business together, how do I get it? Then you're constantly chasing them. And so this sense of sending an email, going checking in, status, uh, update. And, and making a pitch or a sale proposal, sending over a proposal, and then trying to get win that business, it does happen. People do win business. We're an $18 trillion economy, mm -hmm. right? However, the, it's taking the margin mm -hmm. out of the business. That's where we are today is uh, low conversion and near marginless business. And that's why Flip the Script was needed. And so you find that as prevalent in B2B as in B2C? Uh, it's extremely prevalent. Uh, I, I give you an image, you know, because there are stories in the book. Uh, you, Raider, you watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. So in the end, the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant has the ability to save mankind and humanity and make the world a better place for all peoples of the earth. And the U.S. government puts it in a crate in a warehouse next to 10,000 other crates exactly the same. That's what B2B buyers do to you. They put you in a box up on the shelf and say, if I need it. I'll take it down. Well, but that's uh, but that speaks to the fact that the <laughs> the salesperson's doing a horrible job of qualifying the prospect. If the prospect's just gonna put the put them on a box on the shelf, it means they weren't qualified to be entering into the buying process anyway. I don't I don't I I in my experience in B2B, uh the buyers are qualified, they have budget, right? But they have far more ability to find other options. The sales cycle goes much longer. Uh, and re much more repricing or discounting is needed to close things. Hmm. Yeah, actually, I, you know, I find that's certainly true in some cases. But again, I think the issue is more there's the failure to qualify on the part of the rep is that oftentimes, I'm a huge believer, and I've certainly experienced this in my career, is you know, Herbert Simon wrote about the difference between satisficers and maximizers. And certainly the maximizers, yeah, they personify what you were talking about, right? We're going to look at every option that we can to make sure we get the absolute best deal. But I find increasingly in, in B2B sales, at least, that the buyers are saying, look, we've, we're only put so much effort into making this decision. At some point, we're going to make the good enough decision and then move on, right? Because we're going to always be looking, to your point precisely, we're always going to be looking because, yeah, we're going to want to get a better deal at some point. But for now, yeah, we put enough time into this. We're going to move forward. 
Uh, I think the buyers, you know, are looking to solve their problems. They are looking to really leverage uh, price and discounting today using the tools they have. And, and so if you're in a situation where you're giving a presentation, uh, the buyer says, send me over a proposal, you can win that business. You might win that business. Maybe you should win that business. It's going to get repriced uh, uh, t- you know, today very aggressively. All right. So I don't say that sort of the central thesis of the book is, is that buyers don't put trust in you and your ideas. This is a quote, how everyone trusts their own ideas, which I think is right on. But it's sort of interesting. Is uh, well, tell me more about that first. And then I, I want to want to talk, get and dive in that a little bit further because yeah, there's also a trend that says actually, given the internet, is people are actually more open to to other people's ideas. But I think I think you're right on this. But I just want to see how you how we square this. So anyway, tell us more about this idea. Is people put more trust in their own ideas than yours? Yeah. And so, and, and by the way, just to put some context, you know, I have a program, uh, online program, probably 5,000 people in it and real businesses. Now, you know, not consumers, B2B, CFOs, mm-hmm. CEOs, real companies. So I might have the biggest negotiation and, and sales Petri dish mm-hmm. out there. And so this is not stuff that, you know, my opinion, these are things that we told CEOs of companies to do, and they've gone out and told their 500 reps to do, and then they come back and go, it worked. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, scientific or quasi scientific. So here's what do we find? When buyers go, you know what? I love this. That, I, how do we work to get... It, it's my idea and I'm motivating the decision that I want to work with you. I want to buy with you. I want to deal with you. That decision is incredibly resilient. It withstands lots of contract negotiation. Uh, it withstands distance. We, we just closed a $3.5 million deal. Never met any of the mm-hmm. parties involved. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, it, it goes on a shorter sales cycle. Uh, and it's incredibly resilient to uh, retrading, repricing, and um, failure to close. And it's not price sensitive. When the idea comes within them that they want to work with you, when you are have tied them down into a yes through the various you know te- techniques that are suggested in sales books since the 1950s, those well, are since yeah, before. Since before, I mean, yeah. but but. Look, I think that's the thing about flip the script um, that that I would say. Almost every sales book I read is been written based on the sales book to the right of it, with just a different author, different nuance to overcoming objections. When you get to a situation where objections are flooding out and you're trying to overcome them, and it leads to argumentation today with the buyer, those deals don't close. Right, I agree. Experience, and so. Every book that's sent to me or I read and I buy lots of books on sales because I want to know what's out there mm-hmm. are about overcoming objections to the satisfaction of the deal. <laughs> now, you can't do it, right? So it's like, but, it, but today it's like Ray Charles swinging at incoming tennis balls with a lightsaber, right? It's just a never-ending process with some hits and some misses, and it's chaotic. doesn't work that well. Well, so, but so again, so to dive into it is, I think that's a great point is, is so why are all these objections coming up in the first place? Yeah. And you know, I think we have a short time here. It's a longer question. Uh, but the, but the, <laughs> take your uh, time. Yeah. The objections are coming up for two reasons that I cover in the book. Number one, and it, uh, status, your status as a salesperson isn't high enough. And number two, you're not perceived as an expert. And if you really unpack, flip the script, as I see, you know, your sharp mind is doing, that's at the heart of it. There's eight techniques in it, Mm -hmm. but how do you have a high enough status coming in, get from the low status position? Salespeople have the low status position. Well, let's let's unpack that because Gartner's done research, Forrester's done research saying that that uh, 80% of CEOs find no value in the interaction with sales reps. Yeah. And so if I were to look at that through the lens of, of your book, what we're saying is, you know, there's not, they don't have the credibility. They don't have the status, you call it, but I'll call it credibility. They don't have the bona fides, whatever, for the CEO to take the sales rep seriously. So... Words are very meaningful here. You know, we're hearing all this stuff in the Trump government, you know, today that very specific words sound innocuous, but to certain groups. Oh, yeah, yeah. Messaging, right. Terrific meaning. Right. So, so I want to take the word credibility and, and I want to be careful of that because credibility is, it's like the word charisma, right? It seems to represent something, 
but it's made up of many different mm-hmm. things. It doesn't sure. have a clear. So for me, when I unpack influence and persuasion in sales, the two factors, uh, status gives you trust. Okay. It is proof that you are respected. You have credibility. There's a whole composite of things that go with status, but it implies trust in the trust in the system. The system trusts you, right? In an industry, the industry trusts you, the government trusts you, friends and and the company. There's trust. Well, then, well, let me ask the question about that though. Yeah. And this is, you know, not to say anything about the point itself, but it's yeah, yeah. You know, the difference between credibility and trust, in my mind, or status, status and credibility, in my mind, is that status seems to be a bestowed state, right? Whereas credibility is an earned state. So I'm getting to that, right? Okay. So I think credibility is packing together a lot of concepts but that, the point, and things point is, underneath it. Right, but, but it's something you earn, where again, it, status, it, could be, status sound, to me sounds like a class. I know you're not making that argument, but to other people read it, it could sound like a class argument, right? It is a class argument. All right, go ahead. Tr- right? Because when you are at the same class, you have imputed and implied and uh, in place trust. The second thing is expertise. And expertise provides certainty. So now, if you have trust and certainty, then you have a deal. That's why status and expertise are the functions of getting trust and certainty. When you have trust and when you have certainty that the things you say will happen, they're, they're, the, the, the bond yield you say is going to happen, the return on equity you say is going to happen, mm-hmm. the lawnmower is going to last you know, 10 years and cut the lawn 50% better you know, in B2B, that the accounting software is going to reduce expenses across the organization, that the HR plan is going to um, reduce HR expenses and make the, the employees happier. Right? That this is the problem in sales. I am not certain that the things you say will happen will actually happen on your watch, on the budget. That's why you have objections. That's a, they're, they're questions about risk, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So once you, uh, when you combine, and the, you know, as the book sort of takes you through the process of raising your status so you have trust and becoming an expert, yeah, yeah so, so you have, uh, uh, so there's certainty Mm-hmm. That that the the problem that the buyer has is easy for you. You've solved it a thousand times, right? It's not right. a push up. Right. Um, it's boring, right? When when my buyers, people, you know, and and you know, people ultimately end up paying me in a million and a half, two million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. You know, sometimes one dollar, mm-hmm. sometimes sometimes negative fifty thousand. But anyway, um, but <laughs> <laughs> are you making are you making that comment to someone off off camera? <laughs> Somebody in the room? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, so when somebody works with us, we're making assertions about what is going to happen in the future. And when they feel like I have done it a thousand times, again, it's not a push up. It's, it's day to day business for us. Right. And they have visibility, you know, this, our, my status is high enough, then they feel comfortable. And that is when they feel comfortable. And, and when they hit that point, what we observe is they go, Hey, uh, how do we work together? When can we get started? Right. When those elements hit, when they feel like this is an easy problem for you to solve, mm-hmm. then people want to work with you. Okay. So I want to break that down for people because I think it's a key takeaway from the book. I mean, you, you talk about your story at the Altitude Group and the, the valet. Um, oh, it's great. Yeah. I mean, that was a real, real uh, breakthrough sort of mental moment for me. Right. So whether with that story or giving another example, so tell people what you mean about how you align your status with the people you're selling to. Yeah. We win or lose deals on the basis of feeling and being an insider, being able to talk to someone in their own language of their business. Mm -hmm. And, And this is really relevant for folks who sell B2B uh, horizontally. So insurance, financial services, you know, if you sell, um, you know, truck repair equipment to the trucking industry, you know, you're going to have this insider knowledge Mm -hmm. and believe you're an insider. It's not that big of a problem, but most of us sell to companies that 
um, uh, we're not in specifically in their business. Uh, and, and so, and that, and that when a semiconductor company comes in, mm-hmm. we have to be able to communicate to them that, that we're an insider and we're at their level in their industry. If we don't, we don't win the account. So being, uh, respected in the industry, known in the industry, knowing the language that people in that business talk to each other in is the easiest way that we've found to immediately raise your credibility, raise your status, raise the awareness that you're an insider. And and without that, people perceive you as an outsider and uh, they're they're constantly skeptical of the things that you are are promising to do. And does that, and this is a interesting point because there's a a broad divide in B2B sales between people who think that sellers need to be specialists versus more generalists. And I think you're making the argument that people need to have some specialized knowledge, certainly in the industry they serve, if they want to get the status alignment. I think if you read the chapter, you'll see you you almost don't need, you know, if you're working with semiconductor, if you're working with trucking, if you're working, you know, with a SaaS company or accounting software or consulting or government, you can't be up to speed completely on what they're doing in their product set and their product mix, right? But until they hear you talk in their language, they know that you speak at some level their language, mm. they're uncomfortable with you. That is just a basic function of, of selling. Um, and, and you know, that's what that whole chapter is, is for, is how to get uh, alignment with someone that you speak their business language. Okay. No matter where your sales team is working from, RingDNA can enable them to be more productive and effective. RingDNA offers a complete platform for remote sales teams that gives reps the tools they need to connect with more prospects and create more opportunities and drive more revenue no matter where they're working from. And managers can get real-time insight they need to coach reps to success. Win more deals from anywhere on the planet with RingDNA. Learn more about how RingDNA helps remote teams at ringdna.com slash remote work. That's ringdna.com slash remote work. New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and so you go on and talk, one of the key things you talk about in your book is this idea of inception, uh, yeah. which I think you took from the, the movie of the same name. Yeah, well, um, we gave credit. We gave credit to the movie. That's right. Yeah. So, and I, I loved your analogy you're using about uh, watching crime procedurals on TV. So, yeah. so tell pe- tell people, yeah, you know, what <laughs> what Inception is, and take them through this analogy because I think it's a good way for well, for think, sellers sellers is. to think about the concept. I think it is, uh, and and normally I don't like to read people the book, but you bring up a good point that's worth discussing. So when you're watching Criminal Minds or those style of shows, Law right? and Order, or whatever, right? Law and Order, right? You get to a point at 41 minutes, 39 minutes, 38 minutes, 42 minutes. I don't know what it is, right? The, where you the, go, I I know who did it. The third, right? the and third you, commercial, right? Third, right. You have outsmarted. The writers, the actors, the real life situation that it's based on, your the other people sitting in the room, and all of Hollywood. You, you did it in your own little mind. That's incredible. What we don't realize, and and my wife always arrives at this point where she knows who did it, and mm-hmm. it's, just, it's the proudest point. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't take it away from her in in any way, knowing what's really going on. You are meant 
to discover that because it makes you feel good and proud and it raises your in, you know endorphins and your chemistry and 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 that's why you sit down and watch those shows over and over again because they make you feel good that you've deduced ahead of everybody else and is, and you've solved the equation that nobody else has solved and you're meant to feel that way it's written so you do feel that way yeah it's the, the, that, the hero's journey you're you're telling the story for you yes you know, I, I, I try to stay, you know, the, I don't think you can find the word hero in any of my books because, the, you know, this hero's journey metaphor, I think really for for day to day, you know, for academics and sales as we are, it's, you know, you kind of story brand and, you know, all the hero's journey. And I'm as familiar with this stuff as anywhere, but it is a difficult to apply to day to day selling for executives and people just need to go out and sell stuff and think about the hero's journey. Am I the village idiot? Am I the walking down the woods? And then a monster appears and i find the wizard and the wizard takes me to the cave. And in the cave, I change myself and then I come out and then I, it's, it is the change within myself. That's interesting for readers. I can't follow it. Oh, I, so agree. I don't, I but, don't deal with the hero's journey. Well, I was referring, I was referring to it a little di- differently is the okay. sense that when they write, when they're writing those procedurals, is they're bringing you in. You, you are the hero of that story. You are that detective. That's why you watch it because you are identifying with that detective. You identify. That's the reason Plato talked about storytelling three five hundred uh, years ago. I don't disagree, but yeah. for my P mind and the P mind of the uh, you know executives that I work with at at you know companies, it's it's hard to internalize you know the hero's journey. But what is easy to understand is that you come to the conclusion and uh the, and and the, the the that moment bubbles up there's no logic process it just it just bubbles up within you and you go aha and you reach an aha moment where you just know what happened you don't go the maid and the policeman and the blood drop and the genetic test and the letter and the may you know the uh the the Taxi driver, none of that. You don't follow that logic from you. Just go, aha, I know what happened here. And that's what we try and create and do successfully create in sales where the buyer goes, I don't know what's going on with me. I don't have a logical connection here. This isn't about pricing. This is about ROI. It's not about value proposition. It's not about delivery timeline or discounting or margin. I just know these guys are right for me to work with. Guys, forget about all this. Let's get started. And, and, you know, the proof is we've just seen it hundreds of times. I mean, we had a deal we signed and the, uh, a venture group who is classically the most buttoned up, lawyered up, difficult to work with kind of organizations wired $6.1 million to our account without signed documentation. And that is a real anomaly. And, but, and, and, and I thought it was anomaly, but we do this over and over again where the buyer just goes, you know what? You're right for us. Let's mm-hmm. forget all other processes and charge forward. There's no other solution for us. We love you. And in fact, you know, if you want to, and, and I really appreciate this, this show, this is a very uh, um, interesting show for me to be on. I could do this for hours because most people go, why did you write the book? What is, <laughs> what is sales? And but I'm not arguing with you or yelling at you. I'm yelling for you. Oh, no, I, I, I enjoy this. This is why I do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, what I was going to say is, for, in, in terms of tactics, you know, mm-hmm. if we pitch and we're talking and, and everything like that, and the buyer finally goes, hey, listen, uh, this, this sounds good. You know, we want you to uh, raise $10 million for our company. Um, so, so why don't we get started? I will say no. What is that? What did you just say to me? Like, that makes no sense. Do you mm-hmm. know how hard it is to raise $10 million? Unless you could say, Oren, I love you, or whatever your ability to say is. Uh, I love you. This is awesome. We're so excited to do this. You're never going to have a more committed partner. And by the way, if we get in a fight, we're not going to disappear and get mad because I know we're going to get in a fight, Mm -hmm. right? We're going to work hard as you or harder to get on the other side of it and keep going. And there's not going to be a better partner because as much, you can't be working harder on our deal than we will. And you're going to see, we're going to work on this together until you can say that to me, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, you know, that's a tactic in addition to one of many, but that is, uh, and that's what the book allows you to do. It frees you up to have these totally honest mm-hmm. 
conversations, which are, listen, as much as you're evaluating us and you want to see what we can do, uh, you know, can we produce the ROI? What, what is our track record? Um, what is our capability? Have we done this before? Are we familiar with it? Can we do it in your industry? As much as you're evaluating us, we're also evaluating you. And that's the time we have to spend together today. Yeah. And, and, I, well, and, I, and I think that I agree. And I, I maybe used the wrong word earlier with the hero's journey, is, but I think that yeah, there's way too much being talked about storytelling today in, in sales. I, but that <laughs> drives me mad. I'm the best storyteller. If you read my emails, read the book, <laughs> you you're not going to find a better storyteller than me. I don't talk about storytelling yeah, right. because it's too hard. Well, like, and it is too hard for Joe Bag of Donuts, right. which I am during parts of the day. Yeah. Like, this is the problem with NLP. This is the problem with storytelling. This is the problem with hypnosis. This is a problem with whatever, right? <laughs> you, it, works in Dan Ariely's lab. Oh, really? 17 college students decided to buy the coffee cup with the pink <laughs> don't, don't get me, don't ribbon get me started. on it, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and uh, um, nine of them decided to buy the one with the blue ribbon on it. Really, Dan Ariely? Okay, I have to sell a million dollars of accounting software by the end of the month. So, yeah. so this is like, we actually do this. So, so at parts of the day, I am Joe Bag of Donuts sales guy. What can I actually do when there's a guy in my conference room who's making a decision on a million dollar account, NLP, Dan Ariely, uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman, decision making. No, there are certain just basic processes that I can do under that kind of stressful situation as a human being to just keep myself out of neediness and supplication because I want the money, need the account. Right. And the point I was getting to with storytelling is that I can start the rant again because you're triggering me. You're, this is great. You know, is, um, uh, you, you would not be a good uh, marriage counselor. You trigger people. Is that, yeah, you know, part of the reason I like I liked the book is it aligns so much with what, what I believe is what, what goes on. Is I think there's only one story you tell in sales, yeah. and that is the buyer's story. Yeah. And so through the whole thing you talk about inception and making your ideas yeah. their ideas and so on yeah. and leaving clues you're building their story. That's all yeah. they they want to know what it's going to be like when they do business with you and what they're going to get out of it at the end of the day. What it's going to mean for them personally, what's going to mean for their business and that's that's all they want to know in order to make a decision. And yeah, yet, yet we get people write books about well there's you know 10 stories you need to be able to tell. And to your point, salespeople can hardly remember one, right? I mean, and to your, you get the heat of the moment, you're not going to be pulling out story number eight to tell somebody. Listen, eight. listen. Yeah, my, my, you know, my parents are from South Africa. I don't know if you know South Africans, but they just have this incredibly rich story. They've got this accent and this storytelling culture. And my mom was a, uh, has a degree in drama. Mm -hmm. She's a clinical psychologist, Right. I grew up in that household, uh, in an academic household, and we love stories. And, and I, you know, I eventually became a writer. I am a, you know, one of the preeminent, read the book, storytellers in our culture. It's hard. Right. Uh, and and it's, it's 30, 40 years in the making. As a salesperson, card carrying, bag carrying, SaaS selling salesperson, you are not, you should not try and tell stories. And, and I want to make this point. Watch, I don't have a clip here to show you, but you know, if we were together, mm -hmm. watch a comedian online, you know, in one of these, sure. these, um, right. And, and they have a limited number of stories, three, four stories will tell in 18 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah, you know, me and my buddy, uh, uh, Hank decided to jump in the car and we thought, Hey, what should we do? And we, we just kept driving and drank a couple beers and we stopped off at the bar and we said, Hey, you want to go to Florida? I don't know. I'm not going to go without Joe. So me, Joe and Hank start heading to Florida, right? For no reason. No. Right. And you're, you're hearing the story and it's going somewhere and, and you realize it sounds like it's the first time he's ever told it. Mm -hmm. And and he's practiced it four or 500 times to make it sound like that. This is an orchestrated story, which has a punchline, right. but, you know, told by a professional. When you see how much energy actors, comedians, you know, uh, um, presenters, TED Talks in our day and age uh, put into storytelling. And so we see those on the web and, and some salespeople think like, hey, I'm going to go into a conference room and tell a story. No, you are not. <laughs> right. The standard of storytelling is so high and entertainment is so high. You I, I, I have thousands. I've trained 80,000 salespeople. You you know, unless you're the exception, and I understand some do. But the story you think you're telling is um, 
you know, doesn't have the correct dramatic components to be a real story. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we don't try and tell them at all because, uh, um, you know, the training to become a storyteller who really knows the apex, the denouement, the, uh, the protagonist, the antagonist, uh, uh, you know, the reveal is, is, is a real skill set. The most, so the, to your point, yeah, the story has to build inside them. the buyer. Yeah, absolutely. And he needs to tell that story to himself and you're feeding it. You're feeding a bear, right? Do not, you know, you're, you're feeding a bear, which is dangerous and you're giving the food, right? And, and, and the story builds within him until he's satisfied. Uh, in the metaphor of the bear, which I just made up and isn't a real metaphor, the bear takes a nap. But in the metaphor of the buyer, the buyer just rolls over and goes, yeah, just, you know, right. where's the contract? Take my hand and s- sign it. But you actually, you actually do have a story in the book, though. And it's the type that, yeah. I, that I've that i trained yes. a thousand salespeople on, which is your flash roll. Yeah. This- the flash roll is a story. It's 120 <laughs> seconds max. I teach it so it should be 45 seconds max. But it's, yeah. it's still basically the same idea. You want to know that. Thank you. And, yeah. and that is a story. And that's, that's what they need. That's the type of story someone needs to hear. So explain what the flash roll is. Um, so if, if you can indulge me for a moment, I can tell you where it, it came from. Uh, is that other investment banks would call me up and say, hey, we have a client. They're a tough client. Can you do your thing? Right? And so the thing is, I'd get on the phone. You know, I'd help other, our competitors mm-hmm. out, convert. Mm-hmm. And they'd give me a little spiff uh, for doing it. So CEO of a company would come on. And they'd want to sign him uh, to banking services. And I would say, you know, hey, what's the story of the company? And then let the CEO go on. Oh, you know, we're a SaaS software company. And, you know, we started in my garage and we grew to $20 million. And then we land an account. We're $40 million. And now we, you know, we have 60 people. Uh, we're going really fast. We want to acquire a company. And I say, after, I let him go for four minutes. He goes, stop, Carlos. Are you, are you kidding me? Right? You have four people on the phone right now. Each of us could put a billion dollars of capital in front of you this afternoon, but none of us would do that because what you're saying makes no sense to anybody (laughs) in institutional finance. It's right. Why? I have a question for you. Why aren't you saying this? Uh, Based on last year's results, we achieved $20 million in sales. And through Q3 uh, of last year, we are uh, accelerating at a a 35% year-over-year growth, which is beating our CAGR um, by 15%. And compared to the competition, we're at least four times in uh, sales revenue growth. However, we are burning through cash based on the cost of media. We do feel like media will deaccelerate in cost as we reach a critical tipping point at the $50 million. And $10 million will probably get us to $100 million two years sooner than we would otherwise organically. And that's why we've priced our deal at $100 million and are looking to seek a small round on top of the last round we did uh, mm-hmm. last quarter of $5 million, uh, and $10 million, And that's about where we are. That's, that's probably 25 seconds. If I, Carlos, if I let you go on for the next hour, you're not going to say that. Why aren't you saying that? Because that is the language of finance. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Can you say that again? Wait, God, did <laughs> let anybody me write, record let me write that? It, let me write it down. Yeah. Let me write it down. <laughs> I've heard that a thousand times. Can you say that again? Let me write it. So that is a flash roll. Giving somebody information about your product, your service, their problem, and the probable solution mm-hmm. as if you have done this a thousand times yesterday. It's the most boring thing in the world. You actually don't really want to do it again, but you will on their behalf. And the th- elements that deliver that is you're talking about a problem, you're talking about the probable solution. In very technical terms, which mm-hmm. most people are afraid to do, you're not talking about it for comprehension. They don't need to understand what you're saying. They need to know that you know what's going on. And I, I arrived at that when we pitch venture firms, right? And they, they always ask a question about, uh, hey, tell us about the competition. Yeah. That is, this is a 20-minute meeting. Mm-hmm. That is a two-hour conversation. It's not possible to do it. So they're not actually asking you to waste you know, 10 minutes of a 20 minute meeting on the competition. they just want to know that, you know, where every single competitor is. And there are two nine-year-olds in their mom's basement in Sweden doing the same thing tomorrow, mm-hmm. right. And putting you out of business. That's all they want to know. And, and as fast as possible. So it's just putting, uh, as rapidly as possible at a pace that is two or three times faster than anybody could be making it up in very technical terms to put your knowledge in context that you know this better than anybody else. I give you an example. You know, if that's not enough, I can give you an example. Um, but but um, 
I don't know. Should we explore it further? You well, want to give no, me your flash I, rolls? <laughs> no, yeah, I, tell me I, what think, I think I think people need to go read the book. Um, so yeah, we're actually we're a little bit out of time, but uh, we could no. <laughs> let's, let's do this for two more hours. You are awesome. <laughs> well, like, thank it, you. well, I don't really get to talk about this stuff at this level of depth. Right. You know this. By the way, if you're listening, you know the the the, the, the don't let the, these ideas scare you. The book, I think you'll agree, lays it out mechanically. Yeah. Hip, Here's, let me say one more thing. I saw sure. one of the reviews they had online. And so we got a great book. I love it. Orrin did it again. This is a great, you know, one thing that he left off, Orrin, you know, the book, he didn't, he didn't talk anything about emotional anchoring. I don't do emotions, right? Well, you, you do, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, maybe I do the emotion of angry, you know, and hungry, but uh, I, I don't uh, feel, I, I don't have a plot, an emotional plot for the buyer, or I don't uh, think about emotional anchoring or making them feel good or, or feel bad. I think about what is a blueprint that whether you're from China and you just landed in the United States yesterday and you barely have command of the English language, which happens a lot, that you can just go through this process. Because I think people look at salespeople of the past and they think at Don Draper and you know the backslapping a uh, uh, frat boy type who's, you know, at the bar and, and, you know, telling jokes and buying people beers and people love him. And he's, he's closing the business. I'm not that type. Most of the people, and I might appear to it, but if, if, if I do, it's because it's manufactured. Most of the people that I work with don't want sales lines. They don't want to feel cheesy. They don't want to feel like they're selling. They're in some ways academic. They're in mm-hmm. many ways technical. Uh, they have a high status. They're well-regarded. They don't want to sell. And so the book is the process of selling without selling. And that's why it's inception, making the other guy without any overt visibility of sales feel like he, he wants and needs to buy from you. Mm-hmm. So it is, it, is, it is a flowing, easygoing process that is mechanical. I believe in mechanical selling processes, not in emotional uh, sales processes. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll have to have you back and we'll explore that further because I think actually there is a fair amount of emotion, even in what you talk about uh, in the book, uh, yeah. but it's not, it's not overt. As you said, it's not right. the line, it's not the technique, yes. but it does play on it and it's worth exploring. So I'd love to have you back and, and do that again. Uh, okay. Um, I can, uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have to get a cup of coffee. I'll be back in 20. <laughs> <laughs> I wish so. Yeah. Well, well, we got to talk about humor. We got to talk about use of humor. We got to talk about deal size. We got to talk about deal control. We got to talk about perform- performance versus information. There's a lot to discuss. Performance versus productivity. I'd love to get into that with you. So, um, yeah, we'll get together on San Diego sometime too. So, okay, please come by. Yeah, are I you? Uh, uh, what What are your hobbies? You got the kids are grown now. So, what are you doing? <laughs> Running, biking, swimming. Uh, oh, right. what do you What do you run? What are your runs? Uh, well, so we're downtown. So I know this is exciting for people listening. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if they got to this point, they don't care. Well, I run along the waterfront in San Diego and here yeah. at Central Park in, in New York. Yeah. Uh, my bikes are in San Diego. So we do Point yeah. Loma and Fiesta Island and all those rides. Uh, yeah. Easily accessible. So, and people in San Diego, if you're members, you're coming to San Diego. If I'm there, bring your bike. We'll go for a run. We'll go for a ride. Away we go. Yeah. All right. Well, Oren, thank you very much for joining us and we'll look forward to talking again shortly. Okay. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for this week. First of all, as always, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest, Oren Claff. Be sure to join me again next week right here as my guest will be Steve Farber. Steve is a renowned speaker and best-selling author. His latest book, titled Love is Just Damn Good Business, Do What You Love in the Service of People Who Love What You Do. And you know, people who are great at what they do love their company, love their team, love their customers. And next week, Steve and I will talk about the impact of translating that love into action in your work and how it produces measurable results for you. So be sure to join us then. And before you go, don't forget to check out The Sales House. The Sales House is my growth training platform for B2B sellers just like you. If you're a seller who's reached limits of what the science of selling can do for you, and you're interested in learning about the art of winning, then join The Sales House. Learn how to master the human element of selling that will enable you to crush your numbers. So for more information, visit thesaleshouse.com. That is thesaleshouse.com. I look forward to seeing you there. So thanks again for joining me. Until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.
RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the Ring DNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.